Yeah, but we're not here to talk about uh, our. Res- well, I guess we are here to talk about our respective apocalypses, but we're here to talk about games because, as it turns out, I am an amateur. Strangely, actually, we should talk about a little bit about our personal histories because it sort of will help explain why you and I are talking about the things we want to talk about rather than just like some randos we kidnapped and like. I mean, we did we kidnapped each other put ourselves in two separate rooms but only because of you know the sheer amount of distance and pandemic between us yeah so um you yeah i was gonna say you can go first okay i'll go first like yeah yeah. so i'm an i'm uh, an academic question mark (laughs) giant giant (laughs) question mark i do technically teach um i teach for syracuse i don't live in syracuse which for those of you who don't know is in new york i used to live in new york um But I teach um, online classes for them on um, Japanese literature and culture, thus the conversation earlier about Japanese. Um, I used to teach for the University of Iowa. Um, I've had various teaching positions over the years, both there and at other places. Um, I studied, I did my PhD at the University of Michigan in um, comparative literature. So I have, even though my career has been mostly focused on Japanese, um, I've studied a lot of languages. Um, and a lot of literary traditions, but the only one I've ever been able to get a job for is is Japanese. Um, and so it was at Iowa that you and I met each other because I was at some point a teacher of yours, I guess. Yes. Maybe. So if you want to talk about once that. or twice. <laughs> yeah, a couple of times. Yeah, no. So that's that's exactly how we met. Uh, you were my teacher once or twice. Um, at some point, I won't go into it. Basically, you stopped becoming my teacher, and I was like, no, I really want you to be my teacher anyway, because no one else is going to let me do this crazy shit, um, which will let me study fandom, because that's what I really liked at the time. And I still do, because I was a fan. Um, And also Foucault. And I'm not going to lie to you, no other teacher wants to touch this subject with me, Um, because I tried to bring it up in my games design master's program about basically how you form your identity, right? How becoming a fan is important, but then also right, how becoming a gamer is important or how you become the player in the yeah. confines of like a game experience. And I brought it up once and the professor at the time that really liked it uh, ended up stopped teaching, went back into practicum, which means like he went back into the industry yeah. and then, um, and then like hired me for like an internship and that was really cool. So like the people that get it, I obviously, I love those people. Yeah. Um, so i mean my comment on that would basically be that sort of in academia particularly in japanese studies there is this anti-fan bias for lack of a better explanation and you see this all the time and in fact one of the sort of like things that spurred you and i to like actually talk about this more in depth i remember there was this twitter thread about people who were essentially valorizing their teachers who like shat on weeds now, I am yeah. kind of agnostic when it comes to the weeb question. You know, people who are sort of like overly obsessed with um, anime and manga, mostly because I am myself a manga scholar. So that's my other hat. I mean, I teach, my scholarship is mostly about Japanese comics. So the, the very idea that I would shit on someone who's into, you know, manga is kind of strange. But it is a thing. I mean, and like, particularly like academics in Japanese studies are often valorized for like their seriousness. And if you are someone who studies say what I do, you are considered to be non-serious, which is strange because it's really only in the United States or sort of like, I guess you could say in like the Anglo American academic world, because in Japan, uh, manga studies is a thing. It's a pretty big thing. Actually, you can study it at yeah. university. There's a really good program at um, Kyoto Seika. You so, can tour the museum over there. Like, exactly. Like, completely seriously. 
So it's totally weird that in the American context, particularly, this is seen as a non-serious thing. But Lauren, you're right. Yeah, it's like, it's there. And so it was in this weird situation where like, at the time, I had this really strange appointment where I was like, affiliated with, so the University of Iowa, we have this we there's no we here i'm not with the university of iowa i'm just in iowa. i'm just in the area at the university of iowa there's this thing called it's okay i went to the university yeah. of iowa and i still say we, we. and they're like we yeah, there's the royal no we. yeah there's a we iowa and we <laughs> um strangely enough i have this position again because i recently asked about it and i was appointed to it again um <laughs> so i might, might as well get describe rid of you. it yeah they can't get rid of me. So there's this thing at the University of Iowa called the Center for Asian Pacific Studies, which is sort of like an umbrella institute for like Asian studies here. Here. And I had this appointment that was referred to as a research fellow, where essentially it's like you get access to, you know, various resources like the library and other things. And you have to perform certain like very basic academic services for CAPS, which is what it's called, um, but you're not actually faculty. And so I was in this position at the time that you were writing your thesis and you were having a hard time finding someone who would actually like direct said thesis. So as basically my service to the university in exchange for my crappy position, like that's what I did. I was your thesis advisor. Yeah, yeah you were my thesis advisor. That was great though, because for me, like I was, um, so I actually, I'll, I'll start at the, the, what I'm most recently doing. I am actually a professional game developer. And so I am more of that practical voice. I'm not as well read anymore because I've been out of academia. But at the time, my, um, I guess my, my, I was going to say guidance counselor, but that's totally wrong. Uh, it's, it's your kind of it academic, and it's kind of what it is. It's your academic advisor. Um, I had an amazing academic advisor in the international studies program, and I really didn't want to do a thesis because nobody would take on the project. But she basically convinced me that as an honors student, not getting honors when it was just going to be so easy for me um, with all that was going on in my life at the time, she was like, you've got to find somebody who will right, take it on. And for me, the topic was actually the easiest. And it was because I was deeply entrenched in the business college because for my last uh, year, so halfway through, I guess, your junior or senior year of university, I actually started a company um, with my best friend at the time. And we basically were creating a digital print and illustration company from, right, and it largely inspired by anime and manga, as well as in video games. And we did this, which was crazy, um, to start some sort of crowdsourced storytelling software or crowdsourced manga creation. Um, anything that would get artists and writers to come to collaborate together over the internet, it was going to be crazy. And I was super, super passionate about it because I knew that interactive storytelling was kind of the future. I just didn't realize it was in games for me, because as an individual creator and coming from academia and literature, you always hear about the death of the great American author and how the American which, which author- Which is a thing that never really existed in the first place. So. It never really existed in the first place. Yeah, but I mean, you go to University of Iowa, it's number one in the world for writing and you're surrounded well, by you, literarism. You should, you, and I was you should like, explain that. You should explain yes. that like about yeah. Iowa. I'll, I can explain it. Um, so you, you, you should actually okay. explain it. You're in Iowa, so you, yeah, so you do that. The, <laughs> Univers the University of Iowa has two world-class writing programs. There's the Writer's Workshop and then there's the International Writer's Program. Um, Iowa also has- probably after Kent State and Middlebury, probably one of the most prominent MFAs in literary translation as well. So like the MFA programs here are top tier. They pull in talent from all over the place and particularly the, the writer's workshop, not the international writing program, but the writer's workshop. Um, oftentimes people like go into that program specifically so as to like gain connections with literary agents and so forth. It's a really prestigious program. Um, and then Iowa City itself is, has an official UNESCO designation as a, quote, city of literature, which yeah. my wife has actually, actually worked on the city of literature thing, so I know how meaningless that actually is. Sorry, uh, you say that. I have actually uh, studied at three different uh, cities of literature uh, while I was in an undergraduate, because I was actually part of the undergraduate uh, writer's workshop, which is where they take their MFA program and they basically give it to undergraduate students yeah. who are then taught by those MFAs or by other professors. 
And I actually studied uh, playwriting, but then also when I went to the University of Edinburgh, I studied screenwriting. Oh, yeah, um, Edinburgh, yeah. Yep, over there. And then I did an intensive workshop in Ireland, uh, which was the Dublin uh, Writers Workshop at their City of Literature. And so I've actually been through like three different writing programs. <laughs> so uh, I was very much entrenched in the you can't write science fiction because that's not what we do. We being the Royal Iowan we. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a very, um, I should also know that it's a very uptight program here. Um, and I say yeah. that advisedly because um, I have many friends who have gone through the writer's workshop, although most of my friends were poets. And the poetry side of the writer's workshop... Awesome. Work- I was in poetry as well, actually. Yeah, yeah the, the poetry side of the writer's <laughs> workshop is far less hardcore and far less cutthroat. Um, so I guess there's, there's that saving grace, at least. I got both. I got like the playwriting side, which is like everybody wants to be on Broadway or in L.A. Um, and then I got the you know poetry side, which was we need you to create a Twitter account if you don't know what Twitter is so that yeah. you can write poems on it. And I was like, I am here for both of these things. Like, <laughs> I'll take Broadway and Twitter. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, but weird. all of that to lead just all of that to kind of wrap up like my history on that. all of that to kind of lead back into right coming into games because I told weird stories on Twitter or I told really short right dialogue stories um, I ended up then getting my master's at SMU Guild Hall which is short for Southern Methodist University's Guild Hall and got my master's in basically level design which was about creating the player experience and the environment uh, within like an encapsulated area and so now this brings us back to right what we're talking about today Exactly. So I'm a bit of an amateur when it comes to like game dev stuff, but I'm also very much, I do the reading. I'm very fond of doing yes. the reading. <laughs> um, no, absolutely. And so I, I, so here's the thing. So my, my interest in games is mostly from, like I said, an amateurish perspective, but it's sort of informed by my weird sort of like media studies background. Um, and also the fact that, like, over the years, I've always been interested in sort of things that games do that are sort of, like, unintended. So I have an, I have an anecdote that can explain this. Um, when my daughter was learning to read, she actually was having an extremely difficult time. Not necessarily because she couldn't, but because her relationship to language has always been a bit of a fraught one. She's very intelligent, but at the same time, she also has like various um, things that you would group under the category of like quote unquote special needs. I'm not going to get into the specifics because I don't want to like explain my daughter's like. No, and you don't have to. Yeah. And you you shouldn't because, you know, your daughter will one day watch (laughs) these, I'm sure. But given that situation, so she had a hard time learning to read. In the, I guess I should say she had a hard time learning to read in the way that her school teachers wanted her to. Yep. So, what I know, but when we were working with her, one of the things that I noticed is that, like, so she's super into Pokemon, as you know, most kids that age often are. Like, that's not uncommon. Well, my she, age, this yeah, is fine. Yeah, she, I mean, she still is. Like, Pokemon's a thing. It's fine. Um, but the, the, there was this game that she really, really, really wanted to play, which was one of the Pokemon games for the Wii. I believe it's, um, it, was, it was one of the Poke Park games. And, but it's very text heavy. Like it's essentially, you have to read the game. Um, and so, but through her like desire to play that game, she essentially taught herself how to read through playing games, through playing video games. And this is not an, and says this is not a thing that that game was designed for. No one, yeah. I can imagine, no one who was making Poke Park Adventures was like, "Hey, this would be a really great way to teach kids how to read." <laughs> but it's those sorts of like unintended consequences that I find really fascinating, or like um, people who deal with anxiety disorders by playing certain games, particularly like really repetitive ones, like uh, the older Animal Crossing games or like um, Harvest Moon, things like that. I remember yeah. those. Um, Harvest Moon was great. Yeah. So it's, it's those sorts of things that I, I really am interested in. Also, you know, there's, I know a lot about narrative theory. And so I figured like I can be the, I can do the lit review and you can talk more about the actual like, okay, so here's what that, why that's actually important and isn't just boring and dull. No, I, I love that, you know, the lit theory because when I was studying uh, game design and I was studying games, 
It was more about the practical application of it. And that's honestly why I liked the program because after being in business for a little bit um, and just trying my hand at that and the other half of me coming off of like in our academic e-paper, I wanted something that could kind of combine both like theory and practical. And my master's education was perfect for that. Um, and I also had zero technical knowledge at the time. Well, zero is, is, is honestly incorrect. It's what my professors would say, I guess, back then. But um, for like the purposes of developing a game, when I went in, I literally didn't know what Far Cry was. And I was like, what's a Far Cry? I just didn't know it was a game. I really I know didn't. Of Everyone's it. like, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I know, obviously, I know of it now. Yeah. But they were like, well, you can do your application in Far Cry or Skyrim or this thing called Unreal Development Kit. And I was yeah. like, I don't know what a Far Cry is. I think Skyrim is great, but why would I buy a game just to create something in it? Said like pre <laughs> regraduated, uh, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Pre games, Lauren. Four and then years I was like, later. <laughs> Four years later. Yeah. Um, and then I uh, and then I tried. So I did UDK uh, back when you could get like a free copy that was like Unreal Engine like three point whatever. Like yeah. way back in the day. And apparently that's actually one of the reasons why they liked my application was because it was that and a 25 page Dungeons and Dragons campaign because no one else had used like an editor that you basically start from nothing. But I was yeah. just too dumb to know that that was the hardest option. Um, really? Because <laughs> it was, it, yeah. Because uh, you're not actually given anything in, yeah. in, un, in Unreal. You're given a blank slate. Yeah, that's true. And yeah. also back in the day, uh, if you ever like get a brain breaking bug or like a world breaking bug, you'll notice that the environment's usually black. And that's yeah. because that's actually what you're faced with. You're faced with a black screen and then you have to put things in it um, versus in Skyrim or in Far Cry's uh, engine, I guess you were able to like, you can actually load up one of their levels and then save it as a copy. And then you actually are given all of this like environment and stuff and you just have to create within that environment. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So it's important to have that sort of like, I guess, you could, and it's not even really a skeletal structure because Skyrim is itself a complete game. But there oh, are a lot. And the engine is horrible, but I always yeah. recommend it if you want to get into games, just learn it. <laughs> okay, so explain to me what what is what is horrible about the. I mean, I've played Skyrim, so I have, you know, thoughts. But what is horrible about Skyrim's engine? If you feel comfortable talking about it. No, I oh I I. I, I mean, Bethesda, if you want to hire me, I know your engine. Let's, let's talk. Um, but like, <laughs> right? Um, like, that's what I'll have to say. But it's, it's very much an engine where um, the designers and or the engineers have created an experience for the user, the user being a designer or an artist, and they have to follow a certain set of instructions. And mm, that okay. is what is yeah. possible in Skyrim. Skyrim is possible in Skyrim. And so for someone like me who wanted to make something different, like not Skyrim, um, it's it's you can't do it. It's that's what the engine was built for. Something yeah. as simple as say importing a mesh or a texture, uh, which are basically like um, wow, like that's super jargony. Now that I'm like doing that, no, use but the a, jargon, a, use it. Yeah, use the jargon. <laughs> uh, a mesh is like a character. A texture is like their skin. Um, so importing that is really simple in something like Unreal or something that is just, I'm an interface, use me. Um, this has high usability and you can just drag an object in from Windows Explorer and it's like, boop, I'm there. But in Skyrim, it's like, what is that? I don't read it. I'm the engineer and the engineer says you have to go through like 25 steps before yeah. you can import, right, this uh, yeah. thing. Um, and so like, there's this great meme about Skyrim where Thomas the Tank Engine is in the Skyrim universe. That was really freaking hard. Yeah. Like at first I was like, that's hilarious. And then after learning about the engine, I was like, you know what? You are incredible and I'm going to golf clap for you. So I don't praise the mic. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's you what can, that's you what could I use the ASL. Do. Oh, yay! Jazz hands. Yeah. No, it's not jazz hands. So in, in ASL clapping is this. What? So the, the thing that I wanted to talk about is that sort of in doing the reading, so to speak, and sort of looking into the not, terribly large amount of academic literature about sort of like game studies and game criticism I and mean, game studies to me i'm just going to be real it seems like a pretty shallow field um but that's fine like fields at their inception often are like that they sort of try to figure out what they're doing like what their i guess you could say analytical paradigms are and they're often borrowing from others and so you know it's fine and so in a previous conversation you and I had, I became really fascinated with this concept of ludonarrative dissonance, as it's called. 
Um, Lauren, would you like to introduce the concept of ludonarrative dissonance to, <laughs> to our listeners? Yeah, I definitely can. Um, I think ludonarrative dissonance is really funny, and I'll give a little personal antidote here just to kind of frame the concept of ludonarrative dissonance. Um, well, did you say personal antidote? Means, I did. Is it antidote? <laughs> An- an- it an- anecdote. Anecdote? Yeah, anecdote. It's okay, whatever. Personal antidote. There um, you go. I, I guess <laughs> personal <laughs> antidote. Whatever. <laughs> um, hey, we need that right now. Okay, COVID. We do. Yeah. Uh, and I, I guess I will mention that sometimes I say words weirdly because um, I, I guess I grew up where not everybody spoke English 100% correctly. I mean, my, my mother did, and then I took English as like a course, and I still can't speak it right, so whatever. No, I, sh- I should note that, um, sorry, there's, there's no criticism attached to that. I'm sort of hypersensitive to those things because I'm dyslexic, and so it's more like I'm constantly hearing myself and trying to notice those things because oftentimes, I wasn't, yeah. yeah. I was an avid reader uh, as a kid, so I read the words, and I didn't always say them out loud, which is now why maybe I speak too much. Um, but I still pronounce the words incorrectly, but also because one of my first languages was Spanish. Mm. And so I will always say admirable, and I will never say admirable. Ad- admirable. It's a weird word. Like I can't, because yeah. it reminds me of admiral, admiral and that yeah. also is weird to my, my mouth. Admiral. Anyway, uh, ludonarrative dissonance. Yeah. Okay. So getting on the topic of ludonarrative dissonance um, for our listeners out there, ludonarrative dissonance is when the game mechanics and the narrative structure do not match in its simplest form. And my personal anecdote, if that's how we say the we're word. We're going to call it, no, actually, I think we're going to coin a phrase, the personal an- antidote. <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> perfect. Um, so to give a little personal antidote about it, um, I actually didn't really know ludonarrative dissonance was a thing. At the time, I wanted to study Foucault and how forming an identity within the game world kind of represented how you formed your identity as a person. Um, Because you were becoming a person in the game, whether you're actually taking on a character or you're just playing Tetris. Like, if you're playing Tetris, you want to obviously stack all the bricks together. That's a very monotonous and really detailed-oriented kind of person that you are actually becoming. Nobody was really into that until one of the other level designers uh, and my thesis advisor for that project said, it sounds like you wanna do a taxonomy of game mechanics and just categorize everything. And I was like, no, that sounds really boring. Um, it does. I don't wanna just categorize everything of every game, but I wanna show how game mechanics you know, tell, tell a story. So I was like mechanics driven storytelling. And then this other you know, guy came over and was like, oh, it sounds like the opposite of ludonarrative dissonance. And I was like, the opposite of what? <laughs> like, you can't, just, you can't just say there's this thing out there and then I'm doing the opposite because the opposite has to have a name. And yes. so that became my year of a quest to find what is the opposite of two things not working together. And so those, there are lots of names for them. Um, I actually... I was thinking about this in the car, actually, as I was doing errands today, that I have many names for something based on a lot of that early game studies work that you have uh, talked about, which is there is ludonarrative harmony, and that's when there is a synchronized right, interaction between two elements. But there are also things called ludonarrative cohesion, and I believe that that's when kind of both elements are truly kind of one element, like they're really working together. There's also ludonarrative resonance, which I define as when two objects resonate. And you can actually have ludonarrative resonance that's dissonant, right? Um, just like in a, like a score of a musical composition where they're two opposing, right? Uh, instead of having the harmony, it's dissonant, but then it still sounds beautiful. So that's resonance. Yeah, I can so actually- I, I have those three things. So I can actually demonstrate this. This is why I brought my ukulele. I am so excited for the ukulele. I was waiting for this. Okay, so first of all, let's just make sure that the micro... Can you hear that? I can hear that. Yeah, okay. you might want to put a little bit higher, but it's for our listeners to really hear it as well. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just direct it towards the sound box of the instrument. Okay, so this is a C chord. This is a C major 7 chord. So, so both of those chords... 
um, sound fine to the human ear. Um, one yep. will sound a little brighter. That's the C major chord. And then the other will sound a little bit more, oh, hello there. And that's the C major seven chord. So that's this one. So what makes the C major seven oh, chord... hello there. Yeah. Well, hi, how are you doing? <laughs> so what makes C the C... C major seven. The, the, or C seven. You can also just call it a C seven chord. What makes the C seven chord interesting is that there's actually a dissonant relationship included in it. So it's made up of four notes. It's made up of a... So this one up here, which is a G, a C, an E, and a B. Now, for those of you who know anything about harmonic theory, you will know that C and B are dissonant. So I'll play this. So that is a dissonant relationship. But that one is not. And also this one is not. So all of those involve the, the B note, but when you put the entire chord together, you're actually blending this dissonant relationship into these other two perfectly harmonic relationships. So then when you hear the whole thing, it sounds kind of nice. And in fact, interestingly enough, the dissonance actually adds a degree of complexity to the chord that yep. sort of a straight C major doesn't really have. No, absolutely. And I think that's funny because I forgot that, I didn't forget that I was in band, but I always use the music to kind of bring it back to help people understand what Ludo Narrative is actually about because it really is about how something like a game Ludo and yeah. a narrative, it could be story or context or just an objective, a mission, anything that, it, it could be your story as well, especially like in Minecraft where you're building something, it's your motivation. Yeah. It's how you use the Ludo and the narrative together that creates these different and cool, unique relationships. And so we're talking about Ludo narrative dissonance, I think today. Um, so we'll talk about the way those are, they don't actually harmonize, they don't break. Well, it, it's interesting. So this, this phrase, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring this up. So let me bring up my screen share. I actually have the original blog post right here. So yes, let's do it. So this oh, is, I forgot that his blog was all yellow. Yeah, it's, it's here, let me- uh, When he has a new avatar. I'm gonna, um, let's see, I need to move you out of the way so I can zoom this a little bit. So that way it's, yeah. the text is- Yeah, and I'm gonna like not even look at ours right now so that I don't, okay. Okay. Perfect. All right. So now the text should be a little bit easier to read for those who have like vision issues. But yeah, unfortunately, this is like the least accessible way that you can do text on a screen is to have a background color that is the same, that is a similar color value to the text. Because actually, mm -hmm. if, you, if you pull the, um, the RBG from the text, it is itself brown as well. So you have brown text on a brownish background. <sighs> okay, <laughs> so, so that's gripe number one. Okay, so this is a blog post by the um, game designer um, Clint Hawking from 2007. And it sort of frames itself as hey, a, I hope if he ever watches this, <laughs> no, he knows I mean, that like, oh, we, we see this in the most favorable of light. Well, no, I have, I have, I have, I think there are positive aspects to this and I think there are, so not negative, but limited. Uh, no, I, I, I just, uh, I think Clint Hawking would be amazed that we're like pulling this up. I, I think he'd love it because this is exactly what he wants is he wants more critique. So he'd be like, please, please use my my thing and critique. From my perspective, this is just a sort of like, you know, I'm, I'm a literary scholar. So, I, you know, or that's my background. My background is in literary scholarship. So it's like, okay, you have to go back to where the thing came from. And so this is where yep. the concept originates is in this um, review of Bioshock, the game Bioshock from 2007, in which he talks about what he sees as a, literally at one point he says it's a disturbing problem. But um, let's see. Actually, I'll begin with this paragraph right here. To cut straight to the heart of it, Bioshock seems to suffer from a powerful dissonance between what it is about as a game, so the Ludo in the Ludo narrative, and what it is about as a story, so the narrative part of Ludo narrative. Um, later on, maybe in a future episode, I will talk about sort of like the way in which people who study this thing called narratology, which is the study of narrative, they actually break story down into even more parts, but that's for a future discussion. But yeah, I'd, that, I'd love to hear that future discussion later on as well. I mean, essentially, the primary distinction in narratology is between the what and the how. Um, how is usually 
So oh, there's all yep. sorts of, yeah, there's all sorts of terms for this. Um, no, you're bringing it all back. Yeah, I personally prefer uh, the sort of histoire. So usually they're French terms, unfortunately, but I prefer the sort of the histoire discours distinction. So the histoire, which is the French word for story, and discours, which is the same as, well, it's etymologically related to our word discourse. So the histoire is like the what happens in the story and the discourse is sort of how that story is realized, what we might describe as like the plotting or the plot structure. By throwing the narrative and ludic elements of the work into opposition, the game seems to openly mock the player for having believed in the fiction of the game at all. And when we get to it, I'll actually argue that that's probably the intent of the game. The leveraging of the game's narrative structure against its ludic structure all but destroys the player's ability to feel connected to either, again, I think that's intended, forcing the player to either abandon the game in protest, which I almost did, or simply accept that the game cannot be enjoyed as both a game and a story and to then finish it for the mere sake of finishing it. So what is the form of this dissonance and why does it shatter the internal consistency of the work so totally? And then he, st- he goes into something that the, um, the devs who worked for 2K at the time, because this was before Bioshock was taken up by other studios. It was, it was still when... Um, so by, for those of you who don't know, Bioshock was developed by many of the same people who worked on the older um, Fallout games. And that's why it shares a lot of similarities with the older Fallout games. And they had talked about the fact that there is this critique in the game of Randian, that is Ayn Rand, Randian objectivism, Um, And he goes on to say, the game begins by offering the player two contracts. One is a ludic contract, literally seek power and you will progress, which in many ways is sort of the quote unquote ludic contract of like every first person shooter in existence, like kill stuff. Pretty much every game. Yeah. Kill stuff and you will get better. (laughs) Yeah. This ludic contract is in line with the values underlying Randy and rational self-interest. The rules of the game say if it is, it is best if I do what is best for me without consideration for others. And he even notes this. This is a pretty standard value in single player games where all the other characters in the game world tend to be in direct conflict with the player. So he knows this himself. However, it must be pointed out that Bioshock goes the extra mile and ties this game mechanical contract back to the narrative and spectacular faction through the use of the Little Sisters. By dressing up the mechanics of this contract in well-realized content, I literally experience what it means to gain by doing what is best for me. I get more Adam. And in the game, Adam is this like drug slash like power juice that you sort of use to enhance your character without consideration for others by harvesting the little sisters thus the ludic contract works in the sense that i actually feel the themes of the game being expressed through mechanics the game literally made me feel a cold detachment from the fate of the little sisters who i assumed could not be saved or even if they could would suffer some worse fate at the hands of tenabom which by the way is a real assumption like that's when I read that mm-hmm. for the first time, I was like, uh, why did you assume that? <laughs> Harvesting. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. Yep. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say what's really interesting here is um, maybe this is jumping ahead, but a lot of people's critiques of this piece specifically all relate to that one assumption actually right there because a lot of players actually saved them because they felt that in a world where no one could be saved, they felt more control and more... Um, authenticity as a character that they would at least help these people. And that goes into the relationship of freedom and power, which he also talks about. So we'll go into it later, but I did want to just do that quick aside here because you are correct. It really is an assumption here because it's how he chose to play. And then here to me is sort of the, the, the first, I guess you could say meaty morsel in this post to be successful. The game would need to not only make me somehow adopt this difficult philosophy but then put me in a pressure cooker where the systems and content slowly transform the game landscape until I find myself caught in the aforementioned trap. Unfortunately, when we take the first ludic contract and map it to the game's second contract, the game falls apart. So that is in many ways the essence of his critique, that you have this one aspect of the game, the gameplay, what you do as a you know, what you do with your avatar in a first-person shooter game that also has RPG elements like that, because it doesn't match with what he presumes to be the narrative thrust of the game, the game falls apart. Now, the reason why... Oh, so I actually... I had not played Bioshock until reading... In fact, until very recently. So the reason why um, we began our discussion... Maybe this won't get included in the final recording, but 
<laughs> when Lauren and I first started talking, we, talk, we were talking about our respective apocalypses. And so this sort of forced me to be inside and find something productive to do with myself. So I actually played through Bioshock for the first time about a month ago. Oh, I, had never, I had never played a Bioshock game in my entire life. And it's interesting because I went into it with this critique in mind and I was like, I don't know what he's talking about. One, I think the game is brilliant. And I actually think the game is more brilliant than he gives it credit for. So I'm going to bring up, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop this share. And I'm actually going to bring up, let's see, share computer sound. There we go. And I'm going to bring up the game. Oh, man. So I have my save. This is so, great. so I played up until the point that I want to talk about. And the point that I want to talk about is not the first time you see the little sisters. The first time you see the little sisters of the Big Daddy is actually when you're sort of like knocked out and they kind of come up to you and then get chased off. But this and is I will make a note here, hold on, that you need to adjust your game volume because so you don't, um, I feel like it might be recording over your, your voice. So just repeat the last thing that you said and I just want to make sure that when you get into the game, you do the adjustment. Okay. So can you still hear me at this point? Yeah, Maybe. I can totally still hear you, but I think you need to. You should go into your settings. Yeah. From having streamed, you should just turn it down about like 40%. Okay. I just want to make sure that you do that. And then just literally um, repeat everything you said after. Yeah, so just turn it. Yep, three is fine. Three, three? or two is going to okay. be fine. Let's do two. Because, yep. I mean, what I have to say is probably a little bit more important than the game sound yeah. at this point. Yep, okay, perfect. And then just repeat everything you said from... Uh, uh, so I want to bring up Bioshock. Okay, so so I want to bring up Bioshock, and I specifically want to... Okay, sorry. It did sort of got me out of the game. Okay, so this is not too far into the game. Um, this is the first time the little sisters are explained to you by the game. Or rather, yep. I'm coming up to that point. And so at this point, I still just have, you know, the wrench. I have, a, I have a gun I picked up too, and then I have the lightning hands. And pretty much you can play the entire game with just the wrench and the lightning hands. It's, it's the best way to play the game. Really, it's easier because all the other abilities, I'm like, why is this useful? Okay, so we're in the, uh, the lobby of a theater. And so you see it right up there, the Footlight Theater. And then this is the door. The door is blocked. It's jammed. You can't get in. So as part of the gameplay, you need to figure out how to get into there. And you know, outside there is this little like sound stage. There, there is a bit that I already did where you have to kill some people in the water using the electric hands. There's a bar over here. There were some people over here that you had to kill. Where well, I guess you don't have to, but it's easier if you do. But in order to actually get into the theater, you have to go up to the mezzanine. So that's this upper floor where there is a bathroom. And inside the men's bathroom, there's this little bit right here. And I'm going to stop right here because there's a thing that's going to autoplay the second I go through that entrance. So this is the first time you get an explanation of who the Little Sisters are. And I want to go through this and sort of pay attention to what Atlas says as you find out. Careful now. Would you kindly lower that weapon for a minute? And there he uses that fraught phrase, would you kindly, that you will later find out in the game is sort of a trigger that um, both Atlas slash Fontaine and Ryan use to control the player character. You don't know that at this point, but that's why I can't do anything. I can't shoot. I can't change my weapons. All I can do is move. So at this moment, my perspective and my ability to play the game are constrained by an aspect of the narrative that you will later discover, but at this point you don't know. And in order to get down to where the little sister is, you have to do this sort of like catwalk thing. You think that's a child down there? And so you see her down there. Don't be fooled. She's a little sister now. And Atlas is telling us that no, she's not really a little girl. She's actually just harvesting Adam and she's terrible. You and you have to kill her to get her powers. Blah, 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 blah. Well, that don't count for much down in Rapture. Those little sisters, then we get they down here. carry Adam. The genetic material that keeps the wheels of rapture you can see her over here. Everybody wants us. Everybody needs us. So a guy comes in with a gun. He's about to attack the little sisters. You will see. And she screams. So he attacks her. And then you see... 
Now this is interesting. The Big Daddy comes down from a point roughly similar to where we entered as well. Attacks, kills the kills the, the dude in a very gruesome way. Climbs him up against here. And the guy's body will eventually come through. There we go. That's the big daddy. Atlas tells us that this is the big daddy, he protects the sisters so that they can harvest the Adon. It's all very dramatic, and I have to say, when the first time I played this um, scenario, I was scared shitless <laughs> as it was happening. because As didn't... you should be. <laughs> well, because the thing is, because I didn't realize that the whole thing was scripted and constrained. I thought at some point I was actually going to have to be involved in what was happening before me. And so, no, oh, yeah. and as you, as you also should. Yeah, and so you have to get through. And it's interesting is you can you can search the guy's body now, and I'll take the stuff, break this lock, and then I want to talk about this area in here. So it's really important to note that the entire description of like who the little it's not just like the fact that you have sort of this voiceover through the radio from Atlas, who is not actually Atlas; he's some other guy. But all of this takes place in a theater. It is literally a performance. And I think, I mean, to be honest, I mean, I can't see any other reason why you would frame it this way. I think that actually the game devs want you to understand this as something that is being performed for you. And it's interesting that in that moment that it's being performed for you, you also don't actually have control over many of the game elements you usually have control over. So in other words, it's turning you into a passive audience member, literally, by taking away the control you would otherwise have. And so this is the dude, this is the dude that she was harvesting as you you came down. But also think about the way this is framed. So the big daddy, he jumps from up there. You as the player character come in roughly from here. And so if you think about this for, for a second, the sort of subject position that is being presented for you as the player up here coming in over this over the top is similar to the subject position of the big daddy and so from one way you could interpret this scenario and in fact it's the interpretation that atlas doesn't want you to make but one that the game makes possible is to think of yourself as similar to the big daddy as someone whose role is actually to protect the little sisters but again atlas doesn't want you to read it that way but the game allows for that reading and if you look at the way sort of the, the lighting works in this this scenario there is a there's a flood here on the runway there's a flood here at the door and a flood here roughly where the um the little sister was harvesting this dude and so the lighting is drawing your attention towards those elements towards the door towards her and towards where the big daddy will enter into the scene. And so this complaint that Hawking makes, in fact, I'm gonna exit out of the game real quick. We'll just quit. Sure, yeah, and we can come back to it from a practical standpoint uh, later. Yeah. Yeah, I know I closed it. I just wanna go back to the this. Okay, so the point that Hawking makes that sort of there is this disconnect between the gameplay and the narrative that's, I think, true, but only in a limited sense. So going back to what we were talking about earlier with sort of this notion of harmony as a more complex thing than just like binary relationships. In other words, you can look at the relationship between two notes and they can be dissonant. And I think that's kind of what Hawking is doing here. He's looking at the relationship between two elements and seeing a fundamental disconnect between them. The problem is that disconnect has a larger context. And the larger context is, say, like, you know, the total narrative of narrative progression of the game, the sort of the visual elements, the way that moment is framed for you, the sound elements. Like, there are all these other things that are actually more consonant with a far different interpretation of the game, which is one that's actually harder to pick up on. So the whole idea that, like, the game is telling you not to save the little sisters is not true. Atlas is telling you not to save the little sisters. But there are other aspects of the game that are insinuating to you why you would do it. Yeah. And if we look at it from like that practical standpoint of like the actual level design of it, Bioshock is one of the kind of greatest examples I find where they do 
cyclical storytelling really well. And so in ethnology or in the study of oral history and tradition, you'll come across a concept called cyclical storytelling, which is basically you start with the end of your story and then obviously you would end with the beginning of your story. A lot of old fairy tales are like this, um, like where Cinderella you know, is like shiny shoes or like whatever. And then like, it's the shoe that then like uh, allows her to meet her prince again because she leaves it on the steps. And even though everything else disappears, the shoe doesn't disappear, even though it was also magical. And so that's just like a super quick example. When you look at the level of Bioshock, you start with the door. That's your end goal. So yeah. level design and games do this a lot. It's like, hey, here's your goal. Oh, it's blocked. <laughs> um, Right? And then you have to go find the key. I mean, Legend of Zelda was is obvious at this and that literally the door was locked and they're like, go find the key, Link. Yeah. Um, and so here you are, Link, going to find the key. And as we walk up the stairs, you actually are hearing, right, this ambient noise. You have to go through the, the um, into the theater. And one of the biggest and best ways when we really want the player to feel in the moment without actually showing them a cutscene is to completely change their moveset. It is to change it to where they're only able to do one action. And in a lot of times in games, you can even see this where even if there's like quick time events or there's a button you have to press, it's very often or not we've actually limited your moveset so that if, you, if we tell you to press triangle, you can't press a square. So you press it and nothing happens. That is the yeah. ultimate right change of a moveset. And so you go in, you're looking at it. And I think what's been amazing about the level design is the lighting that you saw going into your goal at first is the same as the lighting you see as you're walking above it, is the yeah. same as the lighting you see when it's being, say, performed to you, when you end up showing something. And uh, Kinlein does this a lot in the Bioshock series, but he is even more overtly with, yeah, it's the theater, right? It's performance, yeah. it's the floodlights. Um, and it's very possible that though the level itself wasn't, it may have may not have been a theater. Maybe it was just like an auditorium and it was a lobby. And then they later on were like, Oh, now it needs to be the theater. Yeah. Um, and so I want to bring that up because it's something where they needed something where the big daddy could come from where you were. Yeah. And then that when you saw it and you were able to kind of see it through the glass, there is that safety barrier there. It's we've taken your weapon away, but actually yeah. you're safe. So even though Atlas is kind of talking about how, you shouldn't save these little girls. There's still that instance of the player rationally, and I'll say rationally in scare quotes here, thinking my person that is like a, an, uh, my objective giver, the person who's telling me what to do and I just have to follow them because you as a player have made that concession to trust them because usually the person who gives you objectives in a game is good. Yeah. Also in scare quotes. Yeah. <laughs> um, even if, right. Even if you're evil, the person that you are taking orders from is still on your side. Yeah, I think right? a way to, I think a way to describe it is you when you go to a, say a quest giver in a game, you assume that they're yep. acting in good faith. Yes, they they're acting in your good, good faith. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. But it's your faith, and so you trust this person. So you've already said to trust what they say. But then they say something that's really weird to you because when you actually are witnessing it. And it's interesting to note that Atlas doesn't actually see what you are seeing. He just knows that the little sisters are there yeah. and he knows that he's like, look, I've, he, he's already heartless, but then you see someone else that's kind of like you, just another, just, I was going to say just another dude, bro. That's hilarious. But yeah, well, just another yeah, dude, kinda, bro. Yeah. Come in. Yeah. He's going to, he's going to go murder this innocent child to take this thing. But you just got like your electro hand, you just got your powers yeah. and another world has opened up to you for power and for progression. And so the argument Atlas is making to you comes at a time in the game when you already have gotten right new power. Yeah. So he's saying, oh, people only need them for their atom. That's the only reason why they're there. Don't be fooled. They're just these atom harvesters. They're keeping like the economy afloat, so to speak. But then you see it performed by someone who in direct, almost like, you know, as if quoted for Atlas, he's like, he sent this dude to come attack it to show that, yeah, you should just attack it. But the game being the world or the scenario is you shouldn't because Big Daddy will come after you. Yeah. And so now you're going, wait a second, there is the ultimate choice. You actually have the choice you are about to make, another fine example of cyclical storytelling in level design, performed to you as in if you kill the little sister, 
yes, you will have big daddies to contend with and you may or may not have them to contend with regardless. Right. Yeah. Um, because it's a game. You felt like you would have to contend with it. Yeah. Or I, should, I would like to protect the little sister. Sorry. One thing I have add. to add, one thing I have to add is that sort of in the, in the mechanics, like in order to get to a point where you can make the decision to harvest or save the little sisters, you do have to actually kill the big daddies first because you mm -hmm. don't actually get the option unless they're dealt with. Yeah. And yeah. so that's kind of, but it is like the ultimate and it's showing you like the ultimate boss moves, right? It's yeah. layered and layered and layered in this one impactful scene. And there's a reason why we keep talking about the same scene and where I love the reading of, um, where you're like, oh, you take on the role of the big daddy and, and become him, right? In, in this game, yeah. you're supposed to draw that. Um, and I encourage you that if you haven't played Bioshock 2, or uh, it, I guess Bioshock Infinite is after 2, I would recommend just playing Bioshock 2. Isn't well, um, I think you would also really enjoy that. Chronologically Infinite is actually before Bioshock chronologically 1. Chronologically Infinite is before yeah. Bioshock 1. Okay. Um, I have not played Infinite all the way through. Um, I've played a little bit of 2, and I have played 1. Um, so I will just make that concession here, uh, but bringing it kind of back to the, the practicum as you were walking around that kind of that playing field, yeah. um, you're seeing a boss and because you're also in a game and you're not able to attack it, you either feel, you, you probably are just scared shitless regardless, but you could actually also feel secure because you're like, look, I don't have my weapon yet. So even if I do have to fight that thing right now, I'm safe. And right now the little, right, the little sister and Big Daddy are not a threat. Yeah. And so it's this really interesting juxtaposition and multi-layered kind of tutorialization about this world all in one scene. And I think that when Hawking found it and made that choice, I think he experienced all the things we're also experiencing. I think that just by the time and the affordances he gave Atlas with that objective giver, um, trust, right? Yeah. He, he had so much good faith that, I am following along your story. I am progressing in many different ways that by the time he got to that decision, he went, well, it makes sense to harvest them because that's what Atlas is telling me to do. Yeah. And I think that's the crucial assumption. And I don't want to say misunderstanding because it's not no, it's, it's not a mis It's not a misunderstanding. No. It's not a misunderstanding at all. But the, the reading that he put so much faith in Atlas only shows maybe why he needed to put it down for a little bit before he could finish it as he brought yeah. up in his first paragraph. Because a gamer can do one of two things when you give them control. They can either one, agree with their objective giver, or two, disagree with them. And whether or not it's in good faith or it's in like their best interests, they'll still go along with it. Yeah. But I think that scene plays really well to, you are gonna have to decide if you, um, if you agree or disagree with Atlas, if you want to follow Atlas or don't. Because like you said, would you kindly make a choice is not yeah. actually afforded to the player because it is that self-reflective type of critique in that, in that area and especially in that scene. Yeah, and it's a way in which the the narrative itself, so for those of you, I mean, I guess most people who would be listening to this probably are familiar with Bioshock. I'm a weirdo in that regard. Um, but if you're, not no, familiar with, no. if you're not familiar with the total narrative, so like long story short, you end up confronting Ryan, who is the sort of Randian architect of this entire like subterranean, sub, not terrain. Sub and we should, we should mention spoilers here, just for those yeah. of you, if you are not, so if you are um, unfamiliar with Bioshock, uh, Nicholas here is going to go into it and spoilers and then we will actually say in spoilers at the end of it so that you can um, uh, you can then listen in again so that you can go yeah. play Pioshock and then experience this for yourself. Okay, so I really only want to talk about the scene in which you can conf finally confront Ryan in which he uses this phrase, would you kindly again and again and again and he uses it as a way to control the player. And the reason why this is important is because not just because of the resonance with like the when Atlas uses it for the first time, and Atlas is also a guy named Fontaine, as you later discover. But it sort of pulls the wool. So you have this character who supposedly believes in this really sort of shallow notion of freedom, and I can explain later why it's a completely shallow notion of freedom. But at the same time, the very character who believes in this sort of like libertarian philosophy also is like actively trying to constrain what you can do. 
was like going out of his way to do it. And in many ways, the whole like environment that you're in is an active constraint. Like he literally created a world that is designed to force you to adopt a purely like anarcho-capitalist worldview. And that's the only choice you have. And that's analogous to the way in which the, in the game, in order to progress in, and in fact, actually Hawking is, I think, right about this, that in order to progress in the game, you're forced into a series of choices that have a kind of disturbing resonance. Now, Hawking seems to think, so I, I'm not going to, so end spoilers at this point. End I'm spoilers. Not, I'm not, I'm not going to say anything else about the, the final, the end of the plot. But Hawking assumes that that is an unintended aspect of the game and that it is like that the disruption of the sort of that relationship is a way to, it is actually a fault of the game. When in fact, I would argue that it's not a fault at all. And in fact, it is fundamental. To, if the, there is a critique of Randian objectivism, it is precisely that. It is to say that like, here is this ideological worldview that says that like anything is possible. You're free to do whatever you want so long as it is like in your own personal self-interest. But the game itself is, is saying that like, even the world in which that is realized, that can't happen. That can't, that can't possibly be true. And the, even the character who expresses that worldview like, does things that directly contradict it. And so actually, it's not just the narrative that is critiquing this notion of Randian objectivism. It is the gameplay that is critiquing it as well. And that's harder to perceive. That's harder to see. Yeah, it is a lot harder to see. And I wanted to like, like go into that a little bit because when you look at game design, I mean, when you look at game design from like say a game development perspective, what's really interesting to think about is to get Hawking's critique to say, say that you, um, say that you agree with it 100%. You actually have to, if you do agree with it, I guarantee that you have probably made a game in your life and you've probably also had that similar struggle where the player does something that you don't want them to do. Yeah. And I think that it all boils down to what the game allows you to do and what you as the developer want out of your experience. Hawking's first playthrough where he felt like he had to like consume the little sisters because he could see the game mechanic of seek power to progress and to get better. That absolutely is inherent in why you as a player would choose to harvest the little sisters. Not only that, it's actually a hundred percent like rewarded and a lot of other first person shooters where it's like loot everything, get every reward, find every power up. It's a very high achiever and high killer kind of mentality. And it's rewarded right? in this game as well. Like it's, and it's, you, yeah. and it's rewarded in this game as well. Right. Yeah. But I'm saying like, it, it's something that as a game developer, you can see it. You've read it. It's like an author reading a very best selling book. You can see the mechanics and the systems that that author is employing the same way a game developer can look at a game like Bioshock and see the methods that they're employing. And so of course they're just going to take that so that they're like, all my friends have been playing this game. I'm a game developer and I make games. I don't have time to waste on this game. So I'm just going to go with it. And if you just go with it, I mean, that's exactly what Atlas in the character of the game wants you to do. Yeah. And so you're just going along here and suddenly of course you would write super dip down. And so not to play like Hawking's like absolute, look uh like agree with you know everything that hawking is saying but to kind of look at that from the game development perspective like you would absolutely get to this argument that he makes here where the game is completely dissonant with what the story was because as a player just going along for the ride i think they would be completely thrown for a loop to realize that um and in a non-spoiler way, but basically to realize that just by going along with the game proves everything that was inherently doomed from Rapture to begin with, right? It just improves the theory itself. And this whole time you think that you're progressing, you actually aren't, is the argument of the game in its entirety. And so you would be really frustrated and really upset because you trusted this game. You trusted it to give you progress and yeah. power only to discover that despite everything you did, it got you nowhere as a right capitalist society tends yeah. to uh, uh, get to, not to bring this a little bit too close to home right now in this <laughs> pandemic age, but, but that's exactly what it is, right? You get frustrated and you feel isolated and alone and there's nothing you can do. Yeah. And um, whew, way too close to home. Well, but, no, but that's, okay. But that's, actually, how, that's exactly right. What are, what Hawking's uh, making as that argument. 
so I want to go back to to the blog post a bit because you're, you're right. That is actually a perfect. It's both a fair assessment of what he's saying, and it's also, I think he's he's getting to the heart of what is fundamentally problematic about the presentation, but he doesn't quite get to like the next degree, and so. Here, when he talks about the dissonance in, in more detail, it's this paragraph right here. Mm -hmm. He says, that's the dissonance that I'm talking about, and it is disturbing. Now, disturbing is one thing, but let's just accept for a moment that we forgive that. Let's imagine that we, in fact, in many ways, he's saying now what you just said. Let's imagine yep. that we say, well, it's a game, and the mechanics are great, so I will overlook the fact that the story is kind of forcing me to do something out of character. That's far from the end of the world. Many games impose a narrative on the player. In fact, you could probably argue that nearly all games <laughs> impose some kind of narrative on yep. the player. But when it is or the inverse. Yeah. But when it is revealed that the rationale for why the player helps Atlas is not a ludic constraint that we graciously accept in order to enjoy the game, but rather is a narrative one that is dictated to us, what was once disturbing becomes insulting. The game openly mocks us for having willingly suspended our disbelief in order to enjoy it. This is, yeah, so you're right. But what's interesting is that, again, the, the next degree of this criticism, and I think it's something that you picked up on immediately, Lauren, is that this is kind of a description of our daily lives. Like, you know, yep. when, I, when I work in a job and I work for, you know, a, a company, I don't work for a company, I work for an academic institution, which is a weird thing all in itself. Um, but when you work in a job, you have a set of appointed tasks and your choice is either to do them or not. And in many ways, that's exactly what this game is doing to you. It's saying like, here is this thing that may in fact bother you, but you don't get the choice of actually altering what the task is. You either get to do it or don't. In the same way that when your boss comes to you and says, hey, there's a, bunch, there's a huge sewage leak in the basement. You need to go clean it up. Your option is to do it or be fired. Yep. <laughs> right. And even, in, even as a game developer, though, there are certain affordances that we have to make as developers because I don't get to choose everything that I work on. I mean, if I did, well, what a world. But also, I highly doubt that any game would ever get finished. I'm yeah. not an artist, so I would not do art. And that is really fundamentally needed for the game, right, to, to ship and to be visually presentable and not just a bunch of 2D stick figure drawings, which can yeah. be a fun game. But I mean, it wouldn't exactly be like the type of game experiences that I've made um, because artists are great and I love them. Yeah. But a lot of the tasks that you get just in your daily life are, are not tasks that you want to do. They're not tasks maybe that even you need to do, but you have to do or suffer, right? That like, you know, uh, I don't want to call it an unforgivable consequence, but you wouldn't forgive yourself, right? If you're like, ugh. I'm just going to get fired today because I don't want to pick up the sewage leak. It's like, no, because yeah. the next day then you need to pay rent and you got fired. And so now you, right, there is something else that you need to do. Yeah. And so when you look at this, ex this experience, I think Bioshock is what really kind of spearheaded game development theory for a little while, or at least game critique, because it was a game that wanted to reflect upon itself, not just, um, not Randyism, I actually think that Bioshock wanted to be the game that critiqued the game and then use Randyism as a kind of lens through which to actually critique the game experience as itself. Because for me, playing Bioshock, I, yeah, I went along with it. And then just, you know, hopefully like hear me through this whole thing so I can kind of see the faces that you're making. No, I want to hear um, what you have to say. Yeah. But I have an and, thought. Yeah, so I, I, I'm looking forward to it. Um, but when we look at, uh, uh, let me, I'll bring some context into it and then I'll go into why I think that. The first context is when you're a writer or you're a poet, a lot of your first, I don't want to say good poetry, but your first self-reflective poetry is not about yourself or about love or about music in the world. It's actually about writing about writing. A lot of writers, when they start to write, write about writing because they're like, woe is me to be the writer who has nothing to say but must do it for a living, right? Yeah. I mean, we, we've heard that argument. You make movies about making movies, and those actually do really well because people, not in the documentary sense, but like in the, you know, hard, like drama kind of comedy sense of like, we're going to make a movie about a movie. Like this is the book about how to write a book or like <laughs> on writing, for example, which is actually yeah. a fantastic book, Stephen King. Um, highly recommend. But I think that games were trying to be games. Yeah. But this is a game that 
looks at a game itself and kind of puts the framework of what is a game and on top of right the objectivism with Rainianism on top of it. And so a game is just a series of tasks that you cannot choose. So they just went kind of, I don't want to say obviously, but then they layered it with the obvious of, okay, now you, like that's obvious what you have to do. There's that would you kindly thread. We'll throw that out to really show that even the character you're playing could not have chosen, just like you, the player, cannot chose or choose, cannot have chosen, um, cannot choose to, right? You either put the game down or you keep playing it. And yeah. then they put the other affordance of how the narrative describes all of that. And then I think what's incredible, though, is that then they didn't just say self-reflectively do that. They then, right, had the game describe all of those different reflections. And I think that's why Bioshock has such amazing critiques about it. Because if it was just about Iranianism, that would be one thing. If it were just about capitalism, that would be one experience. But because it actually makes us feel and think about the game as a game, that's what truly spearheaded and kind of defined that moment and that critique of that experience yeah. because it used the game really well. And that's why for me, even though I can see exactly where kind of Hawking is coming from and what he's stating, I also have to recognize that it isn't ludonarrative dissonance. And while there might be dissonant elements to it, it has to be like ludonarrative harmony within that experience yeah. because only a genre that could make you argue at the game for doing something, right? Did it in such a way that was harmonious enough to make you believe in that experience to begin with. Yeah. So I, I actually had to take notes for myself because that was really great, Lauren. I, I really appreciate that. I, and I mean that, I really do. Yay. And so I actually, I actually had to take notes because I'm like, okay, there are a couple of things I need to respond to. So one, to go back to the point about sort of like um, Bioshock as kind of a meta critique of gaming or like presenting an idea of gaming that is self-reflexive. Maybe it's not necessarily a critique because I don't think there's a critique of game logic there, but I do think it is mm, self-reflexive. Mm. Yeah. And it uses that self-reflexivity to sort of get at a point about like, your position as like the person operating an avatar within the game. But I don't necessarily yes. think that's a meta critique. Um, hmm. I haven't thought about this. So earlier today I was thinking about, Oh God, this is going to sound like such a tangent, but I'll get to it. But I'll explain why it, it relates. So the first thing I think we should do is in the future, I think we should talk about why dissonance is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, yeah, we can obviously, we'll, we'll do another one of those and we can start with that. So there's that. So, but if you're taking for granted the idea that sort of like having, if not harmonious relationships between elements in a game, at least sort of like, as you said, I like the, the word you used earlier, resonance. Like they, yep. they, they reflect each other without necessarily be like creating a cohesive whole. In other words, you can have things that don't quite work with each other, but at the same time, they are reflective of each other enough that you sort of see what someone is going for. Yeah, and I'd like to actually clarify on that point between like the harmony, the cohesion, and the resonance is that I believe that a good game experience has all three of those types of ludo narrative inside of them that allows them all to work. So the other thing that I want to talk about is sort of the, the subjectivity of the player character in the game. So going back to Bioshock, there is... So, you know, you have your standard, like, FPS elements. Uh, you know, you, you have a dude with two hands, and one hand does one thing, the other hand does another thing. And, you know, you have guns and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the standard stuff. But what's interesting to me is how the game presents to you the notion of, like, choice and the freedom to make decisions. Because this is actually something that Hawking touches on in his piece, although he doesn't really get into it too extensively. I mean, he just says like, you're given a choice and that choice doesn't make sense when you consider it, you know, in relationship to the game's narrative. That's his argument. Um, but what's interesting about choice is that in many ways, he's almost taking for granted sort of like the libertarian notion of choice itself as valid. When in many ways, the game is trying to say that that, I, that concept of freedom and choice isn't valid. And there's philosophical precedent for this. So if you go all the way back to St. Augustine, Augustine wrote a really, really famous tract on the notion of freedom, um, specifically the freedom to choose whether or not to sin. 
And his whole argument in this text called um, On Free Choice of the Will, De Libero Arbitrio, um, is that you cannot make a moral choice unless you are perfectly free to choose its opposite. So if you think about the context of the, the game, so you have this choice. You can either save these little sisters or not. And Augustine would probably make the argument that the moral choice to save you know, these little girls only makes sense, only is a moral choice if you can do the exact opposite. And in the game, you can't. You can either choose to save them or you can literally kill them. I mean, obviously, in the, in the range of moral choices, if, you, if this were the real world, you could do a whole variety of things. You could abandon them, or you could try to convince them not to harvest Adam, et cetera, et cetera. But the game gives you the sort of binary choice. And I, actually, I had a, a professor as an undergrad who explained this phenomenon to me very um, succinctly. She said, so imagine I come to you and I tell you, like, my children are perfectly behaved. They never do anything wrong. They always do what they're supposed to. They're just perfect little children. And then you come to my house and you discover that all my children have been tied to a chair and then bound and gagged. So the fact that they don't do anything bad is meaningless precisely because I, as a parent, have not given them the choice to be bad or to be good. So because the game actually gives you that choice, it means that the moral consequences of that choice actually have meaning rather than just, oh, hey, it's a thing you can do in a game. And that's actually something that's very hard to do in a game sometimes is to actually have that kind of like moral weight to a decision precisely because it's simulated. Sorry, you were going to say. Yeah, no, that's exactly kind of what I was uh, hitting up upon is that a lot of people when we start looking at games to critique or we look at game critique, we always kind of come at it from that player perspective of like it is hard to get moral weight. But when we look at it as game developers, what's really interesting is for our own profession, we actually have those two kind of elements of philosophy of choice. It is what is the designer driven to put into the experience. So it's a designer driven experience or it's the game experience. People talk about what the game needs and you'll hear this come a lot up in development discussion, um, especially with right new and old developers um, who are like giving interviews and stuff. They're like, we were playing the game and then we realized that the combat needed. It's really telling when you hear somebody talk like that because they're talking about the game as if it is alive, it is a world. They have created a system yeah. and the system has dictated, right? It's almost as if the game developer at that point isn't developing anymore. The game is kind of developing itself and there's nothing wrong with that necessary philosophy. But now the game developer almost doesn't have the choice to yeah. develop the game they, the way they want. And we'll put this in air quotes. Um, the second also is completely devoid of the game developer, and that's called the player-driven experience. And when you hear people talk about player-driven experience, you'll hear them talk about things like, well, the player, when we had user tests, right, we realized that the player kept trying to put the shovel against the tree. And we, as the game developers, were like, why would you use a shovel against the tree? But we realized that our system actually allowed for it because the shovel is a wooden handle with a piece of metal and well, that's what the tree needed to go down. And so even though it took twice as long, you could use a shovel against a tree. And you know what? You could probably do that in the real world. So we left it in. And what you'll see in that type of experience is that's using the system of the game experience, but it's because the player have just driven that forward. And so we actually still to this day have those types of two different mindsets. And it's not that one is, say, inherently better than the other, because I think both can be used effectively in a game environment, but that's exactly what we see within Bioshock, where a lot of people would feel that there is a lot of player choice of weapons, player choices of your arsenal, which you actually want to use in your loadout. Yeah. But then there isn't right choice in the narrative other than right that one moral choice. And then after that, you can kind of do whatever, right? There isn't, oh, you abandoned this person or you left the little sister and decided not to do anything with her, or that you ran away from a big daddy boss fight, which I, th I think you might be able to do if I'm remembering correctly, you, if you don't are, want to go after all of the little sisters. You don't, yeah, you, if, don't, you don't have to confront all of them. There are certain yeah. moments in the game where in order to progress, you do have to at yep. least kill the big daddy. At a bare yeah, moment. so yeah, there, there are a couple. I just wasn't sure. I, I didn't remember them being all, but I know that most players do all as well. But even that you could say is in player driven. Like people are driven mad by the fact they have to harvest, they have to, air quotes, harvest yeah. the little sisters or they feel like that's right. So then they try to avoid them. Others are like, I have to save them, 
which means that the big daddy is obviously the bad guy because he's the one that's right bound and gagged their children to the chairs, right? Um, because those little sisters were never given a choice. Yeah. Right. And we should, sorry, one more element of the, the game that we should probably in, interject here is that there's a character, there's a, yeah, there's a character in the game called Tenenbaum who is the one who created the, the little, like what the little sisters became in the first place. And it's worth noting that what they became was her attempt to actually try to save them given the hostility of the environment that they exist in. So it was sort of what they are now is a negative consequence or an unintended consequence of an attempt to actually save them. Yeah. And I think that like when I read a lot of critique about this, like about like Hawking and about ludonarrative distance, but I also have this critique of other games where you see like press X to Jason is the meme um, is you'll have this moment where people will go, what are other examples of just making this moral choice to kill or not to kill? But in a lot of games that morality of to kill or not to kill is not even a choice. Yeah. And I think that where Bioshock somewhat falters in is that your job is to kill. Yeah. Right. And there's even another level in there where killing, it becomes like the sort of snuff uh, film, um, film and air quotes, but it becomes, yeah. it becomes another sort of performance art where killing is just another, another area. And you do have another choice there to kill or not to kill. Um, as well at the at the end of it all, even though the entire time you were just killing, yeah. and it's because I think at the end of the day there is there there is there are excuse me there are these player driven moments and thoroughfare where when you are not in direct um, or not being directly controlled, then it is where that kind of choice power takes over. But at the end of the day, you have to give away your choice to even complete the game. And so that's where I think it is that self-reflexivity. Um, but if you want to see kind of in a more, um, and this is to you, and I guess also to our listeners, if you really, really want to kind of get into that type of self-reflection, I have to recommend a very quick game called The Stanley Parable. Oh yeah, I played, the, I, played, that game up, I played The Stanley Parable. Yeah. If you, if you haven't picked that game up, it feels the game like a game where someone is finally like making a game for the first time. Like it, to me, it has that type of innocence and yet also deep right thought, yeah. kind of also just the the funness of all of that. Um, and it was yeah, just really well executed. Yeah, I would say that's definitely an example of the thing that I was talking about earlier, which is a game that is not only self-reflective, but also has like a meta critique of games. Yes. And also the same developer... Uh, there was another, oh, I can't remember. He did this follow, I don't even really know if you could call it a game, but there was this follow-up project that he did in which like the, the frame is he keeps receiving these like ex incredibly abstract games from someone who's like this recluse. And it's sort of implied at several points that the recluse might actually be him. And this is sort of like him talking about himself. Um, Though I think those are perfect examples of something that is like very clearly presenting you a meta critique of a game where it, it's not just self reflexive, it, it literally is sort of like it's it's literally like opening up the mechanism and yep. saying, like, here is what it is, here is how it works, here is how it's fucking with you, etc. 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 Yeah, versus Bioshock is definitely more of that self reflexivity that actually like makes you think about it and kind of reflect on it versus yeah. I don't think you can get someone that just plays Bioshock and is like, that's a good game. I have nothing to think about. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I maybe I don't want to meet people like that. Maybe is another way of phrasing it. Cause well, no, to, cause to go back to the sort of this question of like, so there's this moral choice that's presented in the game. But if you look at like the vast majority of the game, the vast majority of Bioshock is you kill mobs. Yep. That's it. <laughs> like you do it in inventive ways, but it's mostly just killing things. And I say things pointedly because every creature so to speak that you're sort of just like casually killing in the game is thoroughly dehumanized so they have they have humanoid shapes but they have a kind of zombie like affect and in many ways it's sort of they're easier to kill precisely because they seem to are they seem to already not be human and when the the tension in the game is at its highest is when you have to confront and or kill someone who is more straightforwardly human. Yeah. 
Um, so that's a kind of weird thing in and of itself, and I don't want to get into that. But when you're playing a game like the Stanley Parable, where you don't kill anything at all, I mean, there is a funny sequence that involves like a countdown and a bomb that I'm not going to spoil it for people, but I like I, I find it very funny the way that yeah, sequence yeah. turns out. Um, like there is there is no like it's it's all centered on you. You, you move through an entirely like. Actually, no, I would argue that the Stanley Parable is also extremely dehumanized because the environment that you move through is devoid of any, like, even simulated human contact. There are no, like, humanoid NPCs that you interact with. It's, no, all, right. it's, it's all objects. And so the only human presence in that game is you yourself as, like, the... Because it's, it's made... It was originally a mod for Half-Life 2, right? Yeah, and speaking of... I mean, if we actually uh, bring up different engines that are exciting to use. You can actually see that Source uh, is the engine for Half-Life 2, um, and we'll have to talk about Half-Life 2 at a later date. <laughs> um, that Source is actually very easy to create something that is not that game, yeah. uh, because that game has so many possibilities, versus right the Skyrim mod, which is just making, or Skyrim Creation Kit is really just to make more Skyrim. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting that in those two different kind of avenues, both for right, free creating and obviously free releasing a product, that the Stanley Parable came about, be, I mean, at, it, I don't think it was a mod, but it, it was, it was using that engine, right? And it's kind of like a, a reflection it, of on the genre itself. It, it, it's not, to, uh, yeah, you're right. It, it uses source, but I think what I'm trying to drive at is that it specifically uses Half-Life 2 assets, like it's it's not just sort of it did it did it yeah. I think it did it first I think it did it first because I remember hearing the story from um, the creator of Stanley Parable and I actually also did like a really small interview and I can't remember his name right now and I'm really really I sorry Galaxy Cafe um, which is like his company name yeah. which I remember because I remember the website but I don't remember his name and I feel bad. Um, but I remember doing like a really small like interview with back when I was kind of trying to see how it, how hard it would be to kind of make games and what the process of making games was as a writer specifically. Uh, William, what's his name so you can do a shout out? William Pugh. William Pugh. Hello, William Pugh from... Future Nicholas here. Um, correction, slight correction. The creator of the Stanley Parable was actually Danny Reedon. Um, William Pugh worked on the standalone edition, but the creator was Mr. Reedon. Um, all apologies. Now back to your episode. And let me look up the, 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 the follow-up game that I was thinking of. Yeah, please do. So I remember uh, he was actually studying screenwriting, I think, at the University of Austin, or the University of Texas in Austin. And he was studying screenwriting. And his roommate at the time happened to be the, wanted to get into voice acting or theater or something like that, and just happened to be a great voice for his voiceover for this project. And then he ended up meeting a programmer uh, through the Half-Life forums for doing something like this and then ended up developing games from it. I bring up that story simply because the Stanley Parable was meant as something that was like a critique of writing for the medium of games, as well as being a critique of writing for the medium of games and the, the, the critique of being in a game in the first place. And it was very artfully done simply maybe because it was actually written specifically and explicitly for that. Um, and getting like an insight on the process, it very much felt like actual game development. You have legal pads, you have like pens and papers, you've got post-its and whiteboards. You've got a programmer that like, he's really, really communicative, but then like something happens and then he immediately does something totally different. And you're like, what? That's not what I said. But then you said it as an artist and he said it as a programmer. So, you yeah. know, or he heard it as a programmer, right? Yeah. And so I think that what's really interesting to me is how self-reflective a medium like games can be. And how at this, I don't know, at this time, like I'm feeling that we're still on, we're still growing for it. Like we're still kind of reaching for that self-reflection in other, in other games. Cause at the end of the day, some games, unlike the Stanley Parable, um, and to an extent, even Bioshock uh, is a product. It's a product to sell and to entertain. Well, this is where I think there's a fairly clear analog to the early history of film where like the moment, like, people started to make movies, mostly in France, but also in the US. So, you know, you have these, you have these two major competing studios in the early history of film. You have um, the Lumiere Studios, uh, what is his name? Méliès. So you have Méliès in France, and then you had um, Edison in the US. The Edison films are terrible. 
the Addison films are essentially just functional films. It's like, here is this technology. Here is what you can do with it. Whereas what Melies was trying to do was he was, I mean, he was both in many ways an avant-garde filmmaker. In fact, he basically invented special effects. Um, but he was also trying to like push the limits of what he was working on. Um, and some of his, his works were extremely popular, and a lot of, but a lot of them weren't. And in fact, it was really sort of like later film aficionados who sort of like brought Méliès back into the limelight as someone who was sort of like driving the filmic medium forward at a time when, you know, most silent pictures were like essentially adaptations of stage plays, which is really sort of a very boring thing to do. Um, so it's entirely possible that we are currently living in the in that moment. We're living in the moment where thi- where sort of what will be the like really important thing in the future is currently being done. Yeah, I don't necessarily agree with my my own argument, but I think that's a possibility. But when it comes to like why, well, one you have to look at sort of the way in which the games industry itself is strat- stratified, like you know. AAA developers are by and large not going to make a game like, I don't know, The Binding of Isaac. For the simple reason that, like, when you have that much money and all of those resources available to you, it makes a lot more sense to make a game that is sort of like a huge spectacle. In other words, it makes more sense to make a game like a sort of, you know, a Marvel cin- cinematic, so the, the game analog of a Marvel Cinematic Universe film, rather than making a film like Moonlight, which mm-hmm. itself actually was fairly expensive to make, but its aesthetic is basically the polar opposite of, you know, say like the Avengers films. Whereas in the games industry, you have a similar stratification where you have, you know, sort of AAA developers, but then you also have sort of mid-tier developers or developers like, uh, or like the Telltale games where there is an aspect of them that is really sort of highly developed, but also there are aspects that are pretty perfunctory. Like, Yeah, and I, I think that just to like comment on that a little bit, because um, definitely Telltale went right, right, uh, shut down and then is now being rebirthed as Telltale again, but now in Southern California and with totally different people. Yeah. And I think that has something that when, you, when you're looking at development and you look at AAA and now Quad A and Double A or just A, like, I don't know, <laughs> like assets. Uh, like, I don't even know what the A stands for, to be honest. Um, acquisition. How many A's can you acquiesce? Well, I think the um, that's A, I how think, large. I think the A's are trying to mimic like grading. There's there's a there's a common grading system, like say in the bond market, where you have like triple A bonds, oh, and like okay. double A bonds. Okay. And so the Thank idea you. is, yeah, a, tri- a triple A thing is something that is sort of like it's like the best bet. So the idea is that you know a triple A game developer is something that it's like if you're going to invest in a game Mm-mm. for some reason, yeah. <laughs> then that would be your best bet. Whereas if you're going to invest in something made by like one guy or one woman or one trans individual, you know, in their own home, like working nights, that that's a, that's a very unsafe bet. And so that's where okay. I think the that makes a lot more sense to me because I think that like the grading system for sometimes in the modern consumer like me, who is too young to know what the hell a bond is. No, I'm kidding. Okay. Um, but matter. I mean, I'll, it doesn't really matter. And I think that like at the end of the day, a lot of like when new gamers kind of come to light, they look at, there's two, I I don't know, there's two philosophies. And I'm going to say that when I use the word gamer loosely, I really mean anybody that plays games, whether it's like Candy Crush, Animal Crossing, or like you've only played Call of Duty. Um, And if you've only played Call of Duty, like don't, don't, you shouldn't call yourself a gamer. It's one game. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm ecumenical when it comes to, to games. Yeah. Um, And so, (laughs) And so I do want to like point out though that there is these kind of there's these ideas that you have like big company games and kind of small company games but to yep. me I think that like the future is when gaming is kind of regardless of almost company structure and there is going to be this moment where most game studios are going to be like smaller right double A studios um, but making, you could say, AAA quality projects. I think that's really what Unreal is going after as well, which is yeah. why they make their engine right so easy to use. And Unity to a certain extent as well. Um, but Unity being a little bit more, I guess, I want to say programmer friendly or more, um, like not as easy to pick up, for, be, for me at least. Um, I, know but, what you're ta- I know what you're talking about, but for those who may not necessarily be familiar with sort of like how you acquire assets and how you like use engines, it might be worth talking about, say like 
actually i'll just say it since i know it off the top of my head so you have like you know game development engines you know we've mentioned three already yeah. we mentioned unity we mentioned um the unreal engine we mentioned source um but also sort of those aren't just engines they're also sort of like communities in which you can either purchase or acquire assets, assets being everything from like art assets to like um, what are called objects, like all sorts of things that you can either purchase or acquire that you can use in developing your own games and that you can, you can reskin or, you know, you can then you know, code your own narrative structure using those elements. So that way, like if you're a person who doesn't necessarily have the like artistic talent or you don't necessarily, you're not very good at creating models, like you can just sort of pick them up through this, marketplace really is what it is yeah. and just like plug them into the, the 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 code that you create for it so just to kind of build off of that really quickly um it's not just about where you can acquire assets from there's also kind of two factors i like to rate engines by for their ease of accessibility or being able to really just pick up and kind of do whatever you want on and the first is kind of how easy it is, is it as an artist or as anybody i mean i can 3d model but i'm not an artist how easy it is to import assets into it that you have. So not just acquiring, how easy it is for you to put your shit into this engine. Yeah. Um, and then second, if you had nothing but the engine, how easy is it to create something in it? And I look at it from a design perspective. Um, so please keep that in mind because as a programmer, you could use the command prompt and create asteroids or your own like Minecraft inside of command prompt, which I think is great and good yeah. for you. I can't. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> what, right. And as an artist, you, you also can create beautiful works right in Maya, but then you would never know what it was like to right, walk in alongside your buildings or what it would be. So how easy is it for you to import those things into it, both right, code and art, but then as a designer, how is it easy it is for you to open up that editor and just build a level, build something called a white box, um, which is basic or a gray box, uh, which is rightly labeled for the fact that you can create these things called BSP, which stands for binary space partition. It's a very old term that I don't know if anybody uses anymore. Um, but BSP was because right code is binary. It is a space yeah. and you are partitioning up your binary. Yeah. Uh, so it's a cute little acronym there. So your little BISPs, can you build with those big old blocks, right? Really, really well. And then how easy is it? Using that kind of terminology though, now you're probably thinking there are two other things, Lauren, that you haven't mentioned, Minecraft and Roblox. I was, actually gonna, I was gonna bring up Minecraft, but since yeah. you brought it up. Since I brought it up, isn't that a game engine where you could create really cool things? And I'm like, yeah. you know what? Kind of. No. The reason why I don't consider Minecraft an engine is because you're still building Minecraft. Um, yeah. I will say that something that's been really, that I'm only kind of considering because of my young cousin and my nephew were building on um, is Roblox. And apparently Roblox, you're able to do a lot because they give you the ease of accessibility and it's very easy to pick up and to make yeah. things. I have never personally used Roblox, nor would I, you would actually create like a commercial project inside Roblox as far as I'm aware. So yeah. I guess, you know, for me as a developer, hey, if you're a Roblox developer out there and you're like, I use Roblox to create the next Tomb Raider, hit me up, like, let me know how that's going for you. Yeah. Um, but as a right, programmer, artist, or someone trained, Unreal is really easy for designers to pick up and start creating things called scripts where they don't even need to know code. They can just string some nodes together and suddenly a character can shoot fire from their hands. And then they can also create the really cool city that they can jump around, right? Unity is a little bit harder to pick up because the way that the, it's interfaced is it really is interfaced more for a programmer to input code in that starts running the game. It's more up for components where like an artist would start putting things onto a character and the character does things. Yeah. But it's really, it's not, it's not hard, I guess, but what I'm saying is it's, it's definitely got a steep learning curve, especially for new designers and new level designers, especially because you can't just throw things into it and start kind of jumping around. Um, though some would argue that you can and that I just haven't learned it all. But to my, that extent, I'm like, can you, person who says I haven't learned all of Unity, just go into Unreal and start messing around? Yes. Yes, you can. So that's where I would rank those two. So the thing is, when it comes to the question of what is a, an engine versus, say, something like Skyrim or Minecraft or Roblox, 
So Minecraft and Roblox both are sort of what you could consider to be like the nth degree of a certain like modding logic yep. where they, those two in particular have taken the idea of sort of like modding accessibility pretty much to their extremes where the only thing that you can't modify in Minecraft, you can disable the core game mechanics, but you can't, as far as I know, you can't use the Lua's to actually like change them. In other mm -hmm. words, you can disable core game mechanics and then replace them with substitutes, but you can't fundamentally alter it. Um, and the same is true in Roblox as well. But it almost got me this, in my head, I always made a distinction between sort of like a game engine and something that sort of allows for like that extreme kind of modding. But perhaps it might actually be more accurate to think of them as being on a continuum. Yep, I would consider them as a continuum, especially when you look at Half-Life, because Skyrim... And uh, in, in that notion, uh, Fallout as well, both their editors are completely different editors. It's Fallout's creation kit, which I think is actually called GEC. Um, mm -hmm. And then I don't know what GE stands for. And then there's Skyrim creation kit, which is only for making more Skyrim. And it's because at the end of the day, they're two separate games. One is right that fantasy RPG, which has those mechanics, and the other is a shooter RPG. And they're actually incredibly different. The code yeah. base and the structures, while well, they might share assets, are actually completely different. Which means that the tools to create with them are actually totally different. And so, while you may work for Bethesda on Skyrim, you will actually be completely different than working on um, Fallout. Right? They'll have two different editors there. And then I think on that continuum, you have Roblox and Minecraft. Do you need to go? No, no, I don't. I just received food and I'm, I'm setting it aside. Oh, now. that's... Because I want to finish the conversation until... No, it's, it's fine. My, my, my child is... Yeah, she's just over there. It's fine. No, um, that's awesome. No, yeah, <laughs> and we'll have to get off of here soon, I'm sure, so I can get ready for yeah, my no, dinner. Yeah, no, maybe since we're actually kind of at a stopping point anyway, maybe it would be a good idea to, to stop there and do sort of outro type stuff. So... This has been fantastic, Lauren. I just wanted to emphasize that this is great and I look forward to all of the probably bizarre conversations we're going to have in the future. But for people who want to get a hold of you or follow you, where should they, they look for you? Yeah, so for me, um, I also want to say this has been absolutely fantastic. I knew that we would talk forever, but I wasn't sure exactly how long we would talk or what about. So this has been awesome. Uh, you can get a hold of me on Twitter or on Instagram at the Lauren Ash. Um, and that's Lauren with a Y, uh, which I'm sure you've seen from the podcast description. But if not, like, hey, might as well say it. And you can also see other things that I have to say or think about on my website, which is laurenash.com. And so please hit me up for any conversations or questions you may have had on today's episode on Twitter. Um, and my DMs are open. And I guess I'll say that with a little bit of a hesitancy there, but eh, it's fine. You can always, always talk. And where can they find you? <laughs> Uh, so I have a completely incomprehensible incom Twitter handle. It's U-A-H-S-E-N-A-A. -A. This is a, an Egyptian word that I made up as an undergraduate using Middle Egyptian. So I don't wow, even, middle I don't age. Even, I, yeah, I don't even want to. I don't even want to explain what it means. Uh, so that's my handle on Twitter. Um, and in fact, in most things, um, I have a YouTube channel. It came from the manga, in where I translate older Japanese comics and perform them, which is weird. Uh, but yeah, so my DMs are not open. You have to follow me in order <laughs> to uh, in engage, I guess. But you can also always just at me on Twitter and I usually respond because I'm obsessively online. So that's where you can find me. Um, Lauren, thank you so much. I look forward to future conversations. 